Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 8 2017 NFL predictions. Well, for the fanatic this week, it was a very nice rebound type of week in terms of my records. Um, against the spread, I hit 500. I went 7-7-1 seven, seven, and one against the spread. And straight up, I had the best record of the year for me. I went 13-2 and two straight up. Only missing the two games this week uh, were the uh, Chiefs in that thrilling game. Probably the best game of the year. The uh, last second touchdown loss by the Oakland Raiders. 31-30 uh, to 30, where there were two untimed downs that basically uh, decided the game. Which is very rare in itself. And the other game was the uh, Panthers and Bears game where the uh, Bears defense absolutely just mauled Cam Newton in the Panthers offense. Eddie Jackson became the first NFL player in NFL history to have two 75 plus yard defensive touchdowns in the same game. So good for uh, Eddie Jackson and that team because that was basically all the offense. Mitchell Trubisky only went 4 of 7 for about 100 yards. And I believe they said this uh, the Bears were the first team in NFL history to complete only four or fewer passes and under 100 yards or less for the first time since like 1950. So, you know, kudos to the Bears for that. And the Panthers have a lot of struggles on them, especially offensively. Um, and with their two guards, Trey Turner and the uh, right tackle now out, I think the Panthers are in a world of trouble just because this, this offense doesn't seem clicking and the defense really can't do that much. Um, with how the offense is struggling. I think the Panthers are in for a uh, rough stretch over the next uh, few games. So now overall the, for the year though, I am now 47-55-3 um, against the spread. And straight up, I'm now 64-41. and 41, Which equals up to about 46% against the spread and 61% straight up. So I'm reaching my goals. I don't think getting to the 60% against the spread mark will be uh, attainable this year, but if I can get back to above 500 again, back-to-back -back years above 500 against the spread, I will take that wholeheartedly and happily uh, because of that. Um, as I've said to my uh, viewers over the last um, couple of videos, I think I said last week, um, I've been, I just started my uh, field placement today uh, for uh, my uh, second AA, so I don't have as much time uh, to do these uh, analysis for the uh, last week's game, so I'm just going to go straight into the picks. And before I do that, I want to tell everybody, just for fantasy-wise, the six teams that are in buys this week are the Green Bay Packers, the Tennessee Titans, the Los Angeles Rams, the New York Giants, the Arizona Cardinals, and the Jacksonville Jaguars. So if you have Leonard Fournette, Blake Bortles, DeMarco Murray, Marcus Mariota, Delaney Walker, Eric Decker, uh, Derek Henry, uh... Ty Montgomery, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, Devontae Adams, Carson Palmer, but well, I'm mean not Carson Palmer because he broke his arm and he's now out for eight weeks. Uh, Adrian Peterson, Larry Fitzgerald, um, I already mentioned Jacksonville, uh, Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, Sam Watkins, the Rams defense, Greg Zerline. If you have any of those players on your team, bench them because they will not be playing this week. It's uh, The next two weeks are um, the 13, they're going to be 13 game weeks, so very small margin of error for all the progs for the next two weeks with the, with the 16 buys. All right, so time for my uh, time for my picks. So this Thursday, when the three and four, I'm sorry, when the four and two Miami Dolphins go to the three and four Baltimore Ravens, the Miami Dolphins are three point underdogs in this game. I like the Miami Dolphins here plus three. And the Miami Dolphins straight up. And then the next game in London when the 5-2 Minnesota Vikings go to the 0-7 Cleveland Browns. The Minnesota Vikings are 9.5 point favorites in this game. I like uh, Minnesota here minus 9.5 in and Minnesota straight up. And then the next game when the 3-3 three three Oakland Raiders go to the 4-2 Buffalo Bills. The... Sorry. The Buffalo Bills are three-point favorites in this game. I like Buffalo here minus three, and uh, Buffalo is straight up. And then the next game, when the two and five Indianapolis Colts go to the two and four Cincinnati Bengals, 
The Cincinnati Bengals are 10.5 point favorites in this game. I like Indianapolis here, plus 10.5, but I'll take the, the uh, Cincinnati Bengals straight up. And then the next game, when the 3-3 three three Los Angeles... I'm sorry, when the 3-4 Los Angeles Chargers go to the 5-2 New England Patriots, the New England Patriots are 7.5 point favorites in this game. I like the LA Chargers here, plus 7.5, um, but I'm going to take the New England Patriots straight up. And then the next game, when the 3-4 and four Chicago Bears go to the 4-2 and two New Orleans Saints, um, the New Orleans Saints are 9-point favorites in this game. I like the Chicago Bears here, plus 9, but I'll take the New Orleans Saints straight up. And then the next game, when the 3-3 three and three Atlanta Falcons go to the 3-4 and four New York Jets, the Atlanta Falcons are 4-point favorites in this game. I like Atlanta here, minus 4, and Atlanta straight up. And then the next game, when the 0-7 San Francisco 49ers go to the 6-1 Philadelphia Eagles. Best team in the NFC against the worst team in the NFC. The Philadelphia Eagles are 13-point favorites in this game. I like San Francisco here, plus 13, uh, but Philadelphia straight up. And then the next game, when the 4-3 Carolina Panthers go to the 2-4 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Carolina Panthers are 2.5-point underdogs in this game. I like Carolina here, plus 2.5. And Carolina, straight up. And then the next game, when the 3-3 three and three Houston Texans go to the 4-2 uh, and two Seattle Seahawks. The Seattle Seahawks are 5.5 point favorites in this game. I like Houston here, plus 5.5. But I'm going to take the Seattle Seahawks straight up. And then the next game, when the... Um, when the... Three, yeah, oh yeah, when the 3-3 three three Dallas Cowboys... Go to the 3-3 three three Washington Redskins. The Dallas Cowboys are 2.5 point favorites in this game. I like Dallas here, minus 2.5. And, and Dallas straight up. And then finally, when the 5-2 Pittsburgh, or for the Sunday night game, when the 5-2 Pittsburgh Steelers go to the 3-3 three three Detroit Lions, the Pittsburgh Steelers are 3 point favorites in this game. I like Pittsburgh here, minus 3. And Pittsburgh straight up. And then the Monday night game. Let me, let me pull that up here. And then for the Monday night game. When the 3-3 three and three Denver Broncos go to the 5-2 and two Kansas City Chiefs. I believe the Kansas City Chiefs are 7.5 point favorites in this game. I like Kansas City here, minus 7.5 in Kansas City, straight up. Alright, it's time for my thoughts on each game. The Dolphins over the Ravens, this is fairly simple. The, Miami, the Baltimore Ravens offense sucks. We we averaged the second fewest yards per game on offense in Baltimore. In four of our last five games, the offense has scored one or fewer touchdowns. Our leading wide receiver is Mike Wallace, who has 248 yards. Mike Wallace, uh, I believe, is in the concussion protocol after that he took from Minnesota Vikings safety, Andrew Sandejo. Um, our leading wide receiver, Mike Wallace, uh, I might have mentioned that. Terrell Suggs is our leading sacker with four and a half sacks, and Mosley's our leading tackler with 57 tackles. But you just look at this Ravens offense, we don't really have an offensive line that can protect Flacco well. Flacco's really not throwing the football well, and we don't really have anybody that can catch the football well. I do put more of the blame on Flacco, just, you know, just because, you know, through the first couple games, he was moving with the offense with Macklin and with Wallace. But I didn't think if you dropped Jeremy Macklin and Mike Wallace from the game that he would, you know, be that bad and be that inept. And he, like, here's the weird thing. We are playing a team that right now is going to not, probably not have their starting quarterback, Jay Cutler, in the game because he cracked two ribs. But Matt Moore played very well. Matt Moore went 13-21, 186 yards, two TDs, and one interception. And they completed a 14-point comeback in the fourth quarter to beat the Jets 31-28, win their third straight game, and be in a good spot to still contend for the, not only a wild card spot, but still the AFC East with the uh, Patriots only half a game better than them. And also Cameron Wake had a two and a half sack game uh, against the uh, New York Jets. That's the most sacks he's had since week six of the 2015 season when he had four sacks. And here's the thing. if I, I think with Matt Moore, Matt Moore's been in this system. He was in five games last year. I believe they won three of them. And a lot of people in Miami believe that Matt Moore is a more competent quarterback at this point than Jay Cutler is. Like, Jay Cutler, you know, even though, again, he had a two-TD, one-interception game, just like, you know, Moore did. Um, it's just something where Matt Moore is, you know, has more emotion. He probably doesn't throw interceptions at the one uh, at the four-yard line like Jay Cutler did. And I'm going to take the Dolphins because they're also going to have the extra motivation of 
This is the 20-year anniversary, the exact week where the last time Miami won a game in Baltimore, which was only our third season. And also, the last time we played the Dolphins in Baltimore, we blew them out 38-6 to and gave them the worst loss of the regular season. So you know they're going to be motivated from that, and I just look at the Dolphins team and go, they can move the football. You have Matt Moore throwing the Landry, throwing the Parker, or well, Devontae Parker hasn't played a couple games. They have Julius Thomas, they have Jay Ajayi running the football. And yeah, could our defense shut down Ajayi pretty well? Sure. But do I expect the, the Ravens offense to do anything against the Dolphins defense? Not really, no. I, I, I'm not sold on this offense at all. And until I see Joe Flacco play like he did either week two or week um, or week five against Oakland, I'm going to take the Dolphins here just because it's not that I don't trust the defense. I just trust our offense to really be bad and score 10 points. And with Matt Moore at the helm, at the quarterback for the Dolphins, with the weapons he has, he should be able to get more than 10 points to win this game against the, a pitiful Baltimore Ravens team, especially on the offense. Uh, so that's why I like Miami plus three and um, Miami straight up. Next one, Minnesota over Cleveland. This is fairly easy. I want to congratulate Tavius Murray for having the longest two runs of, uh, of the season, and they were over 10 yards. He now joins Dalvin Cook and Carlos Hyde as the only running backs this year to have multiple 25-plus yard rushes in the same quarter. Also, Everson Griffin became the sixth wire to record a sack since the sack stats um, been invented since in 1982 to record a sack in his first seven games. Um, Kai Forbath hit a career-high six uh, field goals. Minnesota's defense fifth in points and fourth in yards, and Case Keenan, for the second time in his career, has won three straight games. And, you know, you just look at the Vikings, that is a solid, consistent football team. Case Keenum's playing good football. Even with Case Keenum on the first throw of the game, throws an interception, the Ravens' offense really couldn't do anything with it, and Case Keenum got his footing together. He was able to get them in field goal drives, and that defense suffocated enough, which is fifth in points and fourth in yards, that the Vikings can, you know, win this game. And right now, they're playing the most dysfunctional and worst team in the National Football League in the Cleveland Browns. Joe Thomas, his 10,363 consecutive snap streak is snapped, and he will he has a torn triceps, and he will be out for the year. And the Browns, since 2001, have started at least multiple quarterbacks every year, and I believe since 2012, in four of the last five seasons, they've at least started three different quarterbacks in a season. That is nuts, that is unheard of, and that's just horrible management by the entire Browns organization. And that's not such a, and that's not just a Hugh Jackson or Jimmy Haslam thing. That was right when they came back from Cleveland after the three-year hiatus. Um, and the Browns quarterbacks have combined with their 17 interceptions, which is the most in the NFL. And I, even though I do want to congratulate Zane Gonzalez for kicking his career-long 54-yard field goal as a rookie, and it's kind of sad that that field goal could not have been the difference in the Browns' first win of the 2017 season. Do I think, you know, the Browns' defense, if it shows like they did against Tennessee, it could cause a little bit of havoc to Keenum? Sure. But do I expect the Browns' offense to really do anything against the Vikings? Not at all. Case Keenum could probably score 10 to 13 points they win the game. Because with how bad and how mistrusted this Browns offense is, I see that Vikings defense possibly pitching another shutout in London, which would be out of the four games that were played in London, the combined scores would be would go to uh, 53 nothing, 97 to seven, and then let's just say 110 to seven in the four London games, which is nuts. Um, I don't really see the Browns having a shot in this game. Cleveland's lost the last four of the last five against the Vikings. And I just trust this Vikings team to play another consistent game of football. Nobody's going to give them credit for beating the Browns, but if you told me the Vikings could be 6-2 and two with four straight um, with four straight wins on their belt, um, that I, I, I would have laughed because I, I did not think this Viking team with Bradford, with Bridgewater, and Case Keenum could hold their own as quarterbacks to guide this team to this uh, point in the season at the halfway mark with a 6-2 and two record. And probably the likely, likeliest team to win the NFC North right now is the Minnesota Vikings. Um, so that's why I like Minnesota here, minus 9.5, and, and Minnesota straight up. Next game, Bills over Raiders. I do want to congratulate Derek Carr. It was his second career 400-yard passing game. Also, Derek Carr's 12th quarter, quarter comeback. It's the most in the NFL since 2015. Amari Cooper had a career high in yards and only his second multi-touchdown game of his career. He had 210 yards and two touchdowns. Also, Navarro Bowman had a fantastic debut for the um, Oakland Raiders. He had 11 combined tackles, 6 solo, and 5 assisted. And for the Raiders, this was a massive win because, first of all, it saved their season for being on the brink of elimination. 
And also, it was only the second time in 11 games the Oakland Raiders beat Alex Smith, an Alex Smith-led team. So, I think it's it, one of the tough things is one of their uh, their first-round pick, Gary on Conley, has missed four straight games. I think that's tough uh, for any defense, especially Oakland, to try to uh, rebound from that. But and here's the thing: I really love what the Oakland Raiders did. They played with they played with a lot of motion. They they played with desire. They played with an urgency that they need to have the rest of the year. But unfortunately, you know, after a high like that, the Raiders tend to, you know, fall down a bit or kind of underplay their expectations. And they're playing a Buffalo Bills team that has quietly been sneaking in as a top ten football team that plays consistent defense has a good managing quarterback, and that can run the football very well. And also, I do want to congratulate Sean McVay. He was in the first game in Bill's franchise history to win a game where they trailed by over seven points at home within the final three minutes of a game. The Bills have never done that before. They did it on Sunday against the Buccaneers. Sean McCoy scored his first touchdown of the season, and the Bills' defense has been doing incredibly well. They're seventh in rushing yards, and they're fourth in points allowed. Um, Though the Bills have lost six of the last eight games against the Raiders, I'm taking the Bucs. Buffalo Bills, just kind of like with Tampa. Do I think Oakland could win this game? Sure. But I, I think Buffalo, they're kind of they're rested right now. I think Buffalo's defense will do a much better job than the Kansas City's. They don't have the flaws that the uh, Chiefs defense has right now. And I just think, again, it's, it's going to be another East Coast trip. The last time they went to the East Coast uh, for this year, they got blown up by Washington. I do not think they'll get blown up by Buffalo, but just kind of like with Tampa, I expect Buffalo at, with that home field with being able to run the ball and with a better defense uh, to have enough uh, gumption and to enough, to enough uh, talent and firepower to grind another win out against a Raider team that's playing desperate, hungry, and passionate to just keep their season alive, especially with how the AFC West is shaping up with the Chiefs uh, pulling away from that division. It should be a great game. I'm excited. Very high-powered offense against a very high-powered defense. In that situation, I'm going to take the defense at home. I think Tyrod Taylor will be able to make more plays than usual against a suspect Raider defense. And I think the Bills get a, their fifth one of the year and have one of their best starts since 2011. So that's why I like Buffalo here, minus three, and Buffalo straight up. Next game, Bengals over Colts. The Indianapolis Colts absolutely were awful uh, last Sunday against the Jaguars. They gave up the second most sacks in franchise history in a single game. The Jaguars sacked Jacoby Brissett ten times. Uh, they got shut out for the first time since week 13 of the 1993 season. And I just look at this Colts team, and I don't know. Like, I really think after what happened in Tennessee two weeks ago, where they had a chance to win the game off a couple bad decisions, you know, if, or well, a miss by Vinatieri, which is rare on an extra point, and if Chuck Pagano just calls a QB sneak up the middle... The Colts could have maybe won. The Colts could have won that game thirty to twenty nine. But after letting Derrick Henry gash them, after letting uh, um, Mariota throw a great pass to Taewon Taylor, I think the Colts' confidence was shot because they know right now they are in the bottom of the basement of that division, and they're likely not getting out with how good the Jags, the Bill, or the Jags, the Texans, and the Titans have been playing. I think at this point, you just let Jacoby Brissett play out the rest of the year. The Colts are basically out of playoff contention. And just let, you know, Andrew Luck rest for the 2018 season. Give him a new offensive-minded coach. You give him, you know, more offensive line help. That defense will gain, continue to gain pieces. And I feel bad for uh, the, the rookie phenom safety, Malik Hooker, who was my defensive rookie of the year, tearing his ACL. He will not get that this year. Now with that injury, and I wish him all the best um, because of that. But, like, I look at Cincinnati, and yeah, you know, they kind of, through the first half, they were playing pretty much neck and neck with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then by the second half, the Bengals could not get um, any hits on Ben Roethlisberger. They could not sack him. And the offense only gained 19 total yards of offense in the second half. But at least with the Bengals, over the last four weeks, even though they're 500 in those games, they have played more consistent football. They have Joe Mixon and Hill run the ball pretty well. Got Andy Dalton making plays to A.J. Green. And with that Colts defense, with how bad it is, Blake Bortles threw for 200, over about 300 yards and a touchdown. He had one of a better career day. So if Blake Bortles can do that, with the limited amount of roster that he had on Sunday, Randy Dalton can definitely do that with a more talented and loaded roster. And the Bengals are motivated because the last two times I believe they played the Colts, uh, one time they got shut out, and then the other time 
uh, they lost um, the wild card game where AJ Green didn't play. Um, I think this could be somewhat an interesting game because if Brissett's on his game and with how the Bengals are, they they may make this close. But I'm just going to trust Cincinnati here because I've seen Cincinnati make strides over the last four weeks to say they have enough talent. They're the home. They're at home, and they should be able to beat a struggling Colts team now with their without their best defensive player. And uh, their defensive assistant, Robert Mathis, just got arrested for DWI in Hamilton, uh, really Georgia, Hamilton, Georgia, or Hamilton, Mississippi. So we'll see. And maybe Brissett could, you know, make it a good game. But just about the Bengals are playing. They're at home. They've gained some confidence. They've, uh, and they just look better in the Colts right now. The Bengals have more potential. They have more talent. And I think that drives over an Indianapolis team that's been struggling to do really anything this year. Um, so, that's why I like, uh, Indianapolis plus ten and a half, but I'll take the, uh, Cincinnati Bengals straight up. Next game, Patriots over Chargers. Look, the New England Patriots, in their last three games, they've given up 14 points to the Buccaneers, they've given up 17 points to the New York Jets, and they gave up seven points to the Atlanta Falcons. So that is... 38 points over the last three games, where in three of their first four games, they gave up 30-plus points. Um, I look at, you know, Tom Brady. You know, he still has never lost to Atlanta. Um, he threw another two touchdowns. He is the oldest quarterback now in NFL history to lead the league in passing yards at age 40, uh, beating out Fran Tarkington when he did it when I think he was 39. Uh, Deion Lewis, Rex Burkhead, James White all had their decent amount of touches. Gronkowski making, looks like making great plays with his arms and the fact that he's just so big and a powerful blocker that Brandon Cooks can just ride him into the end zone. Um, and I, I just feel, again, New England's finding their stride and they're just kind of slowly improving that defense to where you're like, hey, this New England defense, along with Brady and this offense, should be able to win the Super Bowl again and there's nobody that's challenging. They're doing it quietly, but when you you know give up seven points to Atlanta offense that had all their horses out there, that is really impressive to see that. Um, in my opinion, just because I thought Atlanta would have put up a much better game. But speaking of surprising games, I could not believe the Chargers shut up the Denver Broncos. That is the 10th shutout in Broncos history, fourth time by the Chargers. It is the first home win for the LA Chargers uh, for their uh, for the for the Stub Up Center. And the Chargers have won three games in a row. Let me see here. I believe since 2014. Give me one second here. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I believe since 2014, the LA Chargers have won four, four, uh, have won three straight games in a row. So kudos to them. And I, I think the Chargers, they after beating the Giants and beating the Raiders in two close games, I think they gained some confidence and said, we can play anybody, and we, sh we are still a threat in the AFC, definitely for a wild card, but they are still a threat in the AFC um, West division race as well. And from what I've seen out of them, you know, Ingram's running the ball better, they have a Eckler making plays, Hunter Henry's making plays, Keenan Allen, Bosa and Ingram are just causing a havoc, Damian Swear up the middle for them. But at the end of the day, this is a game where the, the Chargers haven't beat the Patriots in a very long time. And just going into New England before uh, New England starts a five out of six game road trip, I just think New England will, you know, be able to uh, put their will together and wrap up their uh, fifth or sixth home game this year with a W to get them to six and two before they go have their bye and then go out to Denver, Colorado. But I'm going to take the Chargers plus seven and a half because I believe in the Los Angeles Chargers to make this a game that can be very competitive, especially the. If the Patriots defense shows up about Stephon Gilmore or Eric Rowe, they'll be able to put up yards on that defense and points that'll make the game close. So that's why I like LA here. The Los Angeles Chargers plus 7.5, but the New England Patriots straight up. Next game, Saints over Bears. This was really tough because the Bears defense and this Bears team is much better than I thought, and they are a better 3-4 and four team than people think. They're the NFC version of the Los Angeles Chargers. They are. Because if you think about it, they could have beaten the Vikings a couple weeks ago, and they should have beaten the Atlanta Falcons week one if uh, Jordan Howard doesn't drop a catch from the five-yard line. 
And when I look at what this Bears team is doing, it's weird because, again, the defense is dominating. They have one of the better run defenses, uh, and they have, I think, also had one of the better – they've allowed some, like, the fifth fewest passing touchdowns. But the thing about the Bears is their offense is kind of an – it's an anomaly because Mitchell Trubisky hasn't really done that much – but every game in the last three games, he makes one or two plays that make you go, wow, that really keep them in the game. But there's just a part of me going where, like, I think the Saints defense, which has improved uh, vastly, and the Saints have won four straight games for the first time since 2013 themselves. Let me see. Since uh, 2013 themselves. They're playing the best football in the NFC South. I believe they should win that division. And I have very little confidence in the... Uh, I have very little confidence in the uh, Bears' offense to do anything against the Saints' defense. And I expect Drew Brees to do better against this Bears' defense because he has more weapons and he's Drew Brees. In all seven games that he's played against the Green Bay Packers, he's put up 300-plus yards. That's really impressive. Do I think he'll put up 300-plus yards against the Bears' defense? No, but I do think the Saints at home with a confidence rising, you know, they're on the verge of winning five straight games um, for the first time since, I believe, 2013 themselves. They haven't been on this big of a winning streak in that long. It's amazing that they haven't, but, yeah, they uh, this will be their first five-game winning streak since 2013. I just think, again, the New Orleans Saints, that defense will do enough the cost Trubisky some harm, and I don't expect the Bears' defense to terrorize Drew Brees with that offensive line and the talent he has, especially in his own arm and ability, for the Bears to win this game. Eventually, the two or three great plays that Mitchell Trubisky's had, he's completing 50% of his passes and he's only thrown two TDs, it has to stop somehow, and I think the Saints are the perfect team to do it because they have an underrated defense that might surprise Chicago, and I just expect the Saints' offense to do well enough, especially through the air, to put up points on the Bears that uh, to for them to cause to win this game. Should be a great game, a, a very solid, well-rounded team against a ferocious defense that is coming back with a vengeance and making the Bears a respectable team and maybe even a contending team for the NFC North. But with Drew Brees at home, with the running game going pretty well, if he doesn't throw interceptions, because he did throw two against the Packers in the first quarter, which was very un-Drew Brees-like, but I'm going to take uh, the uh, I'm going I'm going to take the New Orleans Saints because I trust the offense to do well enough against that Bears defense that the, when the Saints defense is out there, Mitchell Trubisky can't make those one or two great throws to win them the game in a uh, kind of a weird dilemma rolls where I just don't see Mitchell Trubisky rising up to the occasion against the Saints defense, unlike Drew Brees going up against the Bears defense. But that's why I like Chicago plus nine and New Orleans straight up. Next game, Falcons over Jets. Atlanta's the better Atlanta's the better team. And if Atlanta has any pride, they've already got swept by the AFC East this year, losing to Buffalo after having a 17-point lead, losing to Miami when they had a 14-point lead, and then you lose to the Patriots. Nobody cares you lose to the Patriots because most teams lose to the Patriots every year. But if you, don't, if you can't beat a Jet team with a bunch of no-names, a bunch of... Random people like the Robbie Andersons, the Bilal Powells, the Jermaine Curses, the Austin Safarian Jenkins. If you can't beat that team, you really need to go into the mirror and say, what happened the last year and why do we just get swept by the entire AFC East? That should not happen for an Atlanta team that just last year was in the Super Bowl. <sighs> but we'll uh, see how it goes. I'm excited for the game, but I'm going to take the Atlanta Falcons here because I have to put faith in them and the Jets. As great as they played, and the, and the reason, it, and they also should have won that game on Sunday against the Dolphins, is that I just think Josh McCown will make one more accident, or Matt Ryan can make one more play for them to win the game. Also, the Falcons have only scored one touchdown in the last 85 minutes plus of football over the last two games. So that's why I like uh, Atlanta minus four and Atlanta straight up. Next one, Eagles over Niners. Philadelphia's the best team in the NFC, with probably the MVP of the league, Carson Wentz, as one of the better defenses. Prayers out to Jordan Hicks, who tore his Achilles, and uh, left tackle Jason Kelsey, who are both out now for the year with an ACL and MCL tear. 
but they really it really shouldn't matter that they're there in the first place because it's San Francisco who just got blown out by the Dallas Cowboys by 30. The Eagles don't need Jason Peters. Heck, they don't even need Lane Johnson. If you put the backup tackles in there, they still probably could win that game. But I'm taking the Eagles. Best team in the NFC versus the worst team in the NFC. I'll take the best over the worst. But I will I, I will take San Francisco against the spread because I, I do expect the Niners to play better, but not enough to give me confidence to say, um, oh, yeah, they're going to be able to pull off the upset. No, that might be a garbage time TD that makes it a seven-point game that uh, gets me the against the spread win and the Eagles a W to improve to 7-1, and one, the best record in the National Football League. So that's all I like San Francisco plus 13 and Philadelphia straight up. Next game, Panthers over Bucks. The Panthers have shown some promise, but I'd be surprised if Tampa won. Not at all, but I'm going to take the Carolina Panthers here just because Tampa just can't win. I thought Tampa Bay played a much better game overall, but Tampa's defense isn't as talented. Uh, Tyrod Taylor, Sean McCoy, Zay Jones, and Jordan Matthews were ripping up that defense. And with the talent that Tampa Bay has, and guys like Mike Evans, Deshaun Jackson, Adam Humphreys, Cameron Bray, and O.J. Howard, they should be able to go into the game against the Panthers, who have had a very shaky secondary at best and just an inconsistent offense to win this game to get the 3-4 and four and put Cam Newton and his team in the bunker of the NFC South and put a fork in their playoff chance because I believe that they lose this game, the Panthers are out of the playoffs for good. So that's why Carolina here, plus 2.5, and, and Carolina straight up. Next game, Seattle over Houston. Houston, Deshaun Watson is number 2 in total QBR. He's run about 15 touchdowns, only like three interceptions. He's been absolutely phenomenal, and I give him that. But he's also gotten to play the Jags, who are inconsistent. He beat up on the Browns, who are the worst team in football. And then he beat up on the Bengals, who are not as bad as the Browns, but they're not much better. Do I think Houston has a shot to win this game? Absolutely. I think Houston does with that defense and with Deshaun Watson. If he can play out against Legion of Boom, he will earn my respect as a franchise quarterback, and the Houston Texans have found their guy for the next 10 to 12 years. However, this is Seattle, a place that now Russell Wilson is undefeated at MetLife Stadium and at 4-0. But also, you just look at this defense. They've allowed two offensive touchdowns. They've had three or four games where they haven't allowed an offensive touchdown the whole game, which is really impressive. And the offense is doing enough for Russell Wilson at the helm to make plays with his feet, his arm, or both in order for the Seahawks to win games. Do I think Deshaun Watson will be scared of the moment? Not at all. But do I think Houston will be able to get this win? It's kind of like Kansas City and New England. You're playing the contenders of the NFL. And Houston, under those few games, has been very competitive, almost to the edge of winning. But either somehow Russell Wilson, you know, finds a way to win like Brady did. Or, you know, they get a huge kick return from Tyler Lockett or Paul Richardson to ice the game for the Seattle Seahawks. Um, I am looking really looking forward to this game. Really good offense against a really good um, defense. But I'm going to take the uh, Seattle Seahawks here just because they're at home. Russell Wilson's only lost six times at home. And I just trust the Seattle team. With two of their road games out of the way and with the remaining road schedule, they can just focus on their home games uh, to get ready to possibly fight the Eagles for the number one seed, the Eagles and Rams for the number one seed in the NFC. So that's like Houston here plus five and a half. And, uh, Seattle straight up. Cowboys over Redskins. The Cowboys looked phenomenal. Yes, it was the Niners. But also the Niners were in their last five games. They were decided by 13 points those last five games. They blew them out. Yes, it was the Niners and they were a winless team. But the Cowboys deserve some credit for looking like the old Cowboys that we all knew. Also, Ezekiel Elliott scored 21 touchdowns in his first 22 games. That is the second most by any, I believe, running back in NFL history. And... Dak Prescott had his seventh game of, of a rushing and receiving touchdown in the same game. To put that in context, uh, Troy Aikman only did it seven times through his entire career. Um, and like, like here's the thing with Dallas and what Washington, D- Dallas and Washington have gotten both in the same team, where like in their losses they've been competitive somewhat and they had chances to win the game but they couldn't capitalize either offensively or defensively. Two rising quarterbacks, one in Kirk Cousins that's kind of been like the really good stat guy but not the non-winner. And Dax, the overrated guy that a lot of people think that he's winning a lot of games but he's not doing much. But in this instance, there are a couple things that are going my way. It was, number one, the Eagles defensive line 
put a lot of punishment on the Redskins offensive line because all those guys were knocked out of the game. And I don't think Morgan Moses will be 100%. Uh, Brandon Sheriff shouldn't be 100%. And maybe not even Trent Williams, who was down for a bit in that game as well. Do um, And I think that will help the Dallas defense. Do I think Kirk Cousins is a solid matchup against them? Yes. But in the games against the Dallas Cowboys, I believe since 2015, he is 1-3 against them. He did not, he did not beat Dak. Uh, last year and the other time he was in Washington, he could not beat them either. He was 0-3 in, in Washington against them. And the 2015 game was the one with Dan Bailey, who kicked the uh, game-winning field goal after Sean Jackson ran around the field. And there's just a part of me going, the Cowboys know that the Ezekiel Elliott suspension is looming, and I really feel that for Dallas, this is a game where it's the idea where they need this win, because if Zeke gets suspended that following Monday, they're going to be about um, for six games, and I don't expect the Cowboys to maybe win one or two of those games. So to get to above 500 with Zeke and then just have to try to have Alfred Morris and McFadden run the football while Dak's kind of controlling more of the offense is better to be 4-3 and three than 3-4 three and four because if the Cowboys lose this game, you pretty much can cancel their playoff chances like that if that happens. And for Washington, kind of the same thing, because Washington in the next few weeks, they have to go to Seattle Week 9, and they host the Vikings Week 10. I don't expect them to win those two games, and I believe after that, they have to go to New Orleans after that. So they could go on a losing streak here where Kirk Cousins is going to be the same old stick with Cousins. Really good quarterback, going to put up a bunch of numbers that people are going to brag about and say, well, he did this with Terrell Pryor and Josh Dotson and injured Jordan Reed and Chris Thompson. Yeah, I get that. You know what, though? Just from my honest opinion, and Sorry for all the Redskins fans out there. Kirk Cousins and his numbers, forget about them. They can stick it. Those numbers don't mean anything to me. What matters to Kirk Cousins this year is wins. And if he goes on this po- possible one, two, three, four, five game losing streak, I think Redskins fans will finally wake up and say, hey, you know what? We, pay- we paid this guy over almost $50 million over the last two years. He, the best he's gotten is maybe his eight wins and either playoff disappointment in that they couldn't get there or no playoffs at all. And is that really worth $25, 26000000 million? It's not. It's not at all. And that's what I hope, if this happens, and I could be dead wrong about it, for Kirk Cousins, that the Redskins fan base will wake up and say, yeah, it's time to move on from Kirk Cousins and let's maybe get an Alex Smith. Let's, get, let's think about a Jimmy Garoppolo and try that way. Because at least those guys have more potential or have been proven more than a guy like Kirk Cousins who puts up the good numbers but doesn't get the results. And at this point, for me, after what happened last year, the numbers mean nothing compared to the results. So we'll see. But, um, but that's why I like Dallas here, minus 2.5, and, and Dallas straight up. Next game, Steelers over Lions. The Pittsburgh Steelers are the best team in the AFC. They're the number two team in the NFL, in my opinion, right now. And... I just look at them. The defense is playing really solid. Schuster, Brown, Roethlisberger had a solid game. Le'Veon Bell is still running the football very effectively. And I just think with that entire team going into Detroit, a place that Pittsburgh fans love the most because uh, one of their Super Bowl wins over the last 13 years was in Ford Field in Detroit, Jerome Bettis' final game. And there's this thing with Detroit for me where over the last two weeks they got shredded by Cam Newton. They got shredded by Drew Brees, which, okay, fine. You know, Drew Brees can do that. But the fact that they got shredded by Cam Newton and the fact that Cam Newton over the last two weeks hasn't looked nearly as good and he's thrown about five interceptions. How did you let Cam Newton go for over 350 yards, three TDs and no interceptions? And let Drew Brees go for about another 400 yards and put up another 52 point or another 31 points on offense. Do I think Detroit has a shot? Somewhat, because if Stafford can play better, they're rested. They're, they know that their season practicing on the line with how the Vikings are starting to stretch away from the uh, NFC North. But I just think with Pittsburgh, the defense is going to be too dominant. That Detroit offensive line's had a rough time. Pitt, uh, Detroit is the longest active streak in terms of consecutive games about a 100-yard rusher. And I don't think if Detroit can't run the ball, the Pittsburgh defense with Hayden, with Mike Hilton, with Mike Mitchell, with um, Sean Davis... Vardy Burns, they can shut down that Lions offense enough to get the Pittsburgh Steelers another tough, complete physical kind, you know, physical kind of victory. 
So that's why I like Pittsburgh here, minus three, and Pittsburgh straight up. And finally, Chiefs over Broncos. The Denver Broncos are awful on the road. They've only scored one offensive touchdown on the road. They were shut up for the 10th time in franchise history. Four of those belong to the Los Angeles Chargers. They have never been shut, they have never been shut out on the road. And that was also the second longest streak ended by the, the Chargers in terms of not going a game about a shutout. The, the Denver Broncos went 394 games. The last time uh, the Broncos got shut out, you have to go back to October 29th, 1992, when Tommy Maddox played his first NFL start, and they got shut out by the Raiders back then. Tommy Maddox would good, then go on to start two more games, and then he would get benched and would not start another football game for 10 years. Then, you, you look at how the Denver offense has done. They've scored one or fewer touchdowns, kind of like Baltimore. Their offense is becoming Baltimore's, where they just can't do anything. Trevor Simeon, look, Trevor Simeon is a scrub now, and I'm a guy that's defended Trevor, but after watching what he did against the uh, Chargers, especially that one throw to Casey Hayward, where he basically just gifted Casey Hayward an interception, I gave up on him because you can't make that type of throw in that situation. Yes, you weren't going to win the game, but you can't be that stupid to just basically give Casey Hayward an interception. Um, and here's the thing. Emmanuel Sanders is likely going to be out. And yes, the Chiefs defense has struggled over the last two weeks. One, one instance on the ground by Le'Veon Bell and the other instance through the air by Derek Carr. Here's the thing with the Denver Broncos that we're struggling with. That, can't, that Denver offensive line has been a turntable, especially at the right tackle. Um, and I believe Justin Houston or Tom Bali, who should play this week, are going to have a field day against that right tackle. And I just don't see the Broncos being able to beat this Chiefs team. Even if the Broncos, even if the Chiefs defense gives up some points, I expect with the Chiefs they'll be able to run the ball effectively or they'll be able to cause some turnover or havoc on Simeon that they'll be able to you know, make enough plays to put enough points on the board that Simeon can't um, match with his inept offense on the road. Again, only one touchdown scored in the four last five games. And for, Den and for Denver, they have only scored one touchdown on the road, and they have been absolutely god-awful on the road over the last two years with Simeon at the helm. So those are my thoughts, comments, and picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Please let me know if you have any questions about any of the picks or any of my thoughts on any NFL-related topic. And i also like to tell everybody to please check out the NFL YouTube Prognosticators Facebook page. You'll find great people like Andrew Warren, Bridgewater's Finest, Hatbox Nation, Billy B, Keith Bailey, uh, Team Evader, uh, which is Cody, Cody Roy Parker's channel, GM Knows, um, Logan Schiff, The Football Guru, uh, The Stuart Madison Show, trying to get Half Moon's Picks, all those guys and gals that make picks just like I do every week for the NFL season, please check them out. They're all great people. And it's, and it's a fun thing that we all like to do, and we all like to see what everybody else thinks about how they, they have their picks and how, you know, they, they can beat us. <laughs> um, so please check them out. And that is it. So good luck to all teams, players, coaches, fantasy players, and fellow NFL prognosticators. Until next week, this is Matthew Alphanatic signing off. Until next time, so long.